So today I want to continue our discussion of how uh, the, the of the topology of algebraic varieties. Um, so the goal for today is to give is to give a proof of the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem and then talk about some of its uh, consequences. Uh, so if we get to it today, that'll include the Kataira Banerjee theorem, which I, which I, which I think we will. Um, so, <clears throat> let me just remind you, so last time in the theorem, which I attributed to Andriotti and, uh, not Grower, uh, Andriotti and Frankel, uh, it's a different theorem than Andriotti and Grower one. Uh, so last time, the idea was let x be a, uh, let's say, a, you know, let's just say an affine complex variety. You know, you can actually this holds with a little more generality, you know, because, um, you know, it just has to be a complex submanifold of uh, complex space, but uh, we want to say of dimension n. So this is a real dimension 2n. You don't specify that, then it doesn't seem like uh, such an interesting result. But the idea is that uh, hi of x uh, even with z coefficients equals a zero for i greater than n. And the way we proved that was by using Morse theory. So the idea behind Morse theory is that you, you have some function called the Morse function from your space to the real numbers. And then you can view that as a way of kind of producing the space piece by piece. So the idea is that, you know, as, you know, so like the, the kind of the analogy is that there's like a water level rising and then like everything below the water level is what's there or, you know, above, you know, I mean, you can kind of make this analogy however you please, but the idea is that, you know, as the, the topology doesn't change, unless you're passing a critical point. So as you increase the water level, the topology of what's covered by the water isn't gonna change unless you cover like the top, unless you cover like uh, a basin. So that's like producing like a new component or you cover a saddle point. So that's gonna uh, either, that's, that's gonna do something like uh, separate two components or join them, or you're covering like the top of an island. And so that's like, you know, covering up like a missing, uh, a missing disk. And so what this tells you is that it tells you based on the index of the critical point uh, that your space is homotopy equivalent to, uh, you know, some complex made out of cells of dimension less than or equal to n. And so, you know, it's less than, so less than or equal to the, and, and so this bound on n comes from the fact that, um, you know, this is a, a complex manifold. And so, you know, the, the Morse function we used was the distance to some fixed point. And then, you know, you can use things about, you know, the fact that the, uh, the Hessian is gonna be some complex quadratic form. You can say, oh, well, you know, I can just swap positive eigenvalues for negative ones or negative ones for positive ones and say, well, that gives me a bound on the index you know you had the quadratic form plus the identity matrix. Okay, so, right, so, so far so good. Um, and so we're gonna need a topological fact, which says that uh, if, so if u is equal to, so, U is the complement of D in X, then HI of the relative cohomology with Z coefficients is isomorphic to H of, uh, and so let's say this, this X is a smooth, real manifold of dimension 2n, then 
duality we get is that this is h two n i. Uh, yeah, h lower two n i of uh, of e with coefficient of z. So this is Lefschetz duality, and I'm you know not gonna I'm gonna black box this one, but you know it's not really so surprising because you know the idea being that. Uh, well, you know, there's, you know, a duality, like, you know, this is, let's see, so now it's, you know, it's a, uh, like the universal coefficient theorem is going to let you identify uh, homology and cohomology in the same dimension pretty well, and then uh, point gray duality lets you kind of flip, um, and then here it's just a relative version of that, so you have your, uh, your x and your d, and then the idea is that the you know the relative cohomology between x and d is going to be given by what's going on like topological features of the complement. Okay, so I don't really want to touch this because I don't really want to get into like what the technical definition of this is, uh, except just to say that well you have a long exact sequence in cohomology. And what it looks like is I have, I'm just going to be part of it, h i minus 1, uh, let's see, x, z, z. And you have the, bound, the boundary homomorphism to uh, h i of x, z. And then you have restriction h i of d, z. And then you have. Maybe, oh, great, now I should have checked and said, I can't remember if this is like where the, maybe this should be an i plus one and that should be an i. Okay, well, I should have checked. Um, let's see. So, well, basically, you know, so you, I mean, you can tell from this that whatever our vanishing says, it's going to give us that uh, an isomorphism between this and that. Um, whenever this group vanishes, you know, and then there's like a plus one somewhere. So, you know, I can't remember if this is an i or an i plus one, but you know, it's in Lazarus Feld. Um, the way we're gonna figure this out is we're just gonna say, okay, well, um, you know, let's just think about examples and then, you know, we'll see where this holds and where it doesn't. Um, so, you know, in particular, let's see, so I think it's, So let me just state the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem. This just says let x be a projective variety. then uh, hi of x with z coefficients is isomorphic to hi with d coefficients. Uh, so this should be of dimension n. Isomorphic, and then it's for you know i between zero, and then I forget if this is n or n minus one. So let's just think about it. Um, so when you know, so for example, when x is p two, then this is telling us that you know a divisor in there is going to be some curve, um, and then you know the cohomology of p two it's only in even degrees, so it's in. Uh, 0, 2, 4, so it's in 0, 2, and 4. Um, and then let's see, so I think this tells us that, um, 
Yeah, and so then this should be Yeah, so I guess in this case it should be n minus two. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what it's telling us. Okay, so then n minus one it's like injected, right? That's yeah, it's, that's right. So so that's gonna give me what I need to correct this exact sequence. Um yeah, and so I guess we can add the so that hi z is injected into hi dz for n minus one. Well, you know, I mean, in general, it's going to be injective if they're isomorphic. Um, so this will be i less than or equal to n minus one. Okay, so let's see if we can fix this business over here. Um, so let's see. So if so, well, the proof is going to be that the uh, you know the complement of d and x. Well, d is an ample divisor. Well, let me, let me just check here. So then, um, let's see. So then the the vanishing of this thing for for i less than n. This vanishes for i up to 2. Yeah, so I think it's an i plus 1 here and an i here. Right, because yeah. cycles on x to cycles on d should be surjective. Right? right. Most of the time. Yes. So the last half should be connected. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Should have spent a little more time prepping this one, I suppose. Okay. But anyway, so so now we have the right statement. Uh, so let me just add, you know, the last piece of the proof here is just that the complement of D and X is an affine right. So if so just like proof, if u let u equal x and then d, well the idea is that d is ample. So m d is very ample. And so there's, you know, and so then the linear series of m d induces an embedding of x into some projective space. And then if we just say, you know, then we can choose this so that the, uh, you know, let's call this i sub md. So then if I take i sub md of x, and then we intersect it with an, and take the an corresponding to the complement of that hyperplane, it's just giving me u. So therefore, u is an affine variety of dimension n, and then we can unwind the previous exact sequence that, uh, that I just erased to say that, well, the, uh, the relative homology with x with respect to d is going to vanish um, you know, once i gets large enough, or once i is small enough. And you, know, you track through you know, the exact values of i, and you get th these statements. You get that uh, hi of xz is isomorphic to hi of dz. And that h i of x z, so that's for i uh, between zero and n minus two inclusive. And then for uh, for n minus one, you get an injective map. Okay, so we've already seen the example. Uh, you know, I mentioned the example where x is p two, where x is a surface, and there, you know, you don't really get much that's super interesting. But you do get, I mean, you do get those in isomorphism in dimension zero, in, you know, in degree zero. And so what that's telling you is that a hyperplane section of a surface is always connected. So, you know, this is, um, you know, I think this is like, you know, some theorem of growth and deep also, but, you know, so you can, you can get various, like, uh, you know, versions of the theorem in different dimensions. So, you know, let's just go through in each dimension. Oh yeah, so one other thing to note is that 
Nowhere did I use that x was smooth. So x can be a very singular variety, and this still works, because the complement of x is smooth, and, that, and that's where we're really using a theorem. So x could have very pathological singularities, and all of this still works. Okay. And then, or not x, but d could be very, you know, very pathological. Of course, you know, if you want to intersect this, it, it, sorry, if you want to extend this to the case where x is not smooth, um, then your best bet, like, I think there's some version of this using, you know, uh, this kind of uh, interception cohomology. That's kind of the, the kind of topological thing that gets used on a, uh, when, when we're trying to have duality theorems for singular varieties, this kind of Dresky McPherson uh, technique. Okay, so let's talk about the consequences of this for various values of n. So, so n equals two, if we have z inside x a surface, well, you know, I'm gonna assume my surface is just, you know, it's smooth and connected, so then d is also connected. And this is, you know, something we know, right? Is that the, uh, take a hyperplane section, of a, a section of an ample divisor in a surface, it's connected. And so, you know, you can see, for example, if you think about like p1 cross p1, then the, the fibers, those aren't ample. And you know those, you know some, you know section of a multiple of that, you know you can get that it's uh, that it's not connected. But as soon as you're like in the interior of the cone, when you're uh, a divisor, you know of like m n, where those are both positive integers, then whatever you get, it's going to be some connected thing, even if it's singular. Okay. And then for n equals three, then this is saying that the h1, you know, so it goes up to n minus two. So for n equals three, you get up to h1. So we have that h1 of xz isomorphic to h1 of dz. Well, in fact, you can do a little bit better. Um, you know, so there's a you know, so of course, you know, H1, you can really think of this as like the abelianization of the, uh, well, I guess for, for homology, this is what's true, right? It's like the, the, H, the H lower one is the abelianization of the homotopy group because it's like, well, they're both loops, right? But it's like in homology, you know, you can commute loops, but in homotopy, you can't. Um, you know, the difference between like bounding something and actually like being able to track it through. Um, and then, you know, so here it's for, for cohomology, but you can also, there's a variant of this for homotopy. Um, you know, you have to, you know, you have to kind of go back and, and look at what you're, you know, and, and it kind of boils down to the same thing saying that, oh, the complement of u and x is made up of a, it's like a simplicial complex that's not, you know, it doesn't have very high dimensional simplices in it. And then you know you're going to use some sort of Van Kampen type theorem instead of Lefschetz duality, but it's the same kind of idea. So in fact, you also get that uh, that uh, pi one of x is isomorphic to pi one of d. So you know, and I'm suppressing the base point because you know they're both connected. Um, so here, for example, you know. In two dimensions, when you have a curve inside a surface, well, if you have like a curve in P2, that curve is, is, you know, is a real surface of some large genus, and so it has a very complicated fundamental group. You know, its fundamental group has, uh, you know, like two G generators and like one relation. Or, um, you know, or just thinking about cohomology for a if like, uh, if x were a surface and d were a curve of genus g, then you know if this you know this might have this might be zero like on p1 p2, 
And then here for the, the curve, you know, it's going to be like z to the 2g. But then once you go up to surfaces in P3, well, P3 is simply connected, and every hypersurface in P3 is also simply connected. So this says, for example, that hypersurfaces in P3 are simply connected. OK, so let's go on to the next one. So the next one is n equals 4. And so then we get up to, we get h2 of x and z is isomorphic to h2 of dz, along with all the previous ones. OK, so here, I mean, how can you think of this? Well, let's, let's now think about when, when d is smooth. Um, you know, and then the idea here is that, you know, I guess you probably don't even need it to be smooth, but I, th but I think, you know, it's kind of a little bit simpler to think because here, this H2 of DZ, well, this, you can think of it as a turn class of some line bundle. So, you know, and then the idea is that, um, yeah, and so, yeah, you know, so the, the, the H2s that are actually come from churn classes of a line bundle are the ones that are, uh, you know, coming from H, they're, they're really H11 uh, in the Hodge decomposition. But this restriction map is going to respect the Hodge decomposition. That's actually an important fact that we'll talk about later. But here, the way I want to think about this algebraically is that I get a restriction from pick X to pick D, which this is an isomorphism. Okay, and so you know you can see so here this is saying that you know if I have a threefold in P4, then its Picard group is generated by the hyperplane section because the hyper the Picard group of P P4 is you know just like all projective space it's generated by one element the hyperplane section the same is going to hold for the divisor inside X, and you know there's other you know you can kind of there's various statements. Of course, you know, one interesting thing about this is that you can then say, well, you know, what is the Picard group telling you? Well, it's, you know, it's, or, you know, if you take like the cone over uh, that P4, you get a polynomial ring. And that construction, it kind of eliminates that one divisor giving you a trivial Picard group. And so what this is telling you is that the same will be true if you just quotient out by uh, a single homogeneous element. So the idea here being that if I take, um, you know, if I take C adjoin X0 up through X4, and then I mod out by some F, which is the uh, homogeneous polynomial of some smooth variety, then this, ha this ring then has trivial Picard group, which is the same as saying it's a factorial ring. So this ring has unique factorization. So you know you can imagine that like f is like maybe like some Fermat curve, you know, so this could be like x naught to the ninth plus blah 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 up to uh, you know x4 to the ninth, something like that. And it's like, how do you prove that such a thing is factorial? Well this theorem tells you that it is. Um, but, you know, trying to prove that directly seems, you know, quite, quite difficult. Um, and then there's, so then there's the growth nick Lefschetz theorem, which kind of does this, I forget exactly, you know, it's in like a slightly different context. I think, you know, there kind of works, you know, you can relax some of the, I think it's like you can relax the smoothness assumption on X and you still get this. And it's really something about, you know, um, you know, there's some cohomological condition on sheaves that you can replace it with, so some like depth condition or something like that. Okay, but on the other hand, you know, if you're up here, you're thinking about x is p3 and you have a divisor in there, you don't get an isomorphism of the card groups. What you get is, as, as before, you get an injective map. So, what is the deal there? Well, you know, you can imagine like, 
you know, so just for a, uh, a degree two divisor, you get this P1 cross P1 if you choose the divisor to be smooth. And here, this has the correct rank two. And then in degree three, well, that's a cubic surface, which is P2 blown up at six points. That, that has Picard rank seven. And then, you know, you go up to a K3 surface, and then the Picard rank, well, it really depends on which K3 surface you get in moduli. So there, the K3 surface, its Picard rank can go from one up to, let's see, does it go up to 20 or does it go up to 19? I forget exactly. I think, anyway, so the, like the Hodge diamond is like 121. Um, and so I know you can go up to 19, and I forget if you can. I think one of the dimensions isn't necessarily algebraic, right? Yeah, that's the, that's the point, right, is that, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, this is the point, right, is that you're. It's like yeah. one analytic dimension. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the picture is like you have kind of like your block of cheese, someone described it that way like a block of Swiss cheese, but it's like, I don't know, I don't like thinking of holes in it. So maybe it's like, there's like veins of, you know, it's like blue cheese or something. But you have like, these are like 20 dimensional space of analytic K3 surfaces. And then once you fix a genus, then you land on one of these 19 dimensional things. And then raising the Picard rank by one cuts you down. Oh, wait, but I think the point is that being on the 19 dimensional thing means that your Picard rank is already one, so it's algebraic. And then I think you can get it all the way up to 20 just by cutting it down each time. So yeah, so then it, you can get 20. Yeah. Right, okay, cool. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm getting out of this n equals four statement is say for the cubic a cubic threefold. Yep. It's always for card rank rough one. That's right. But I was under the impression that there was cubic threefolds where there it wasn't a card rank one. Am, am I um, mistaken there? Maybe those are singular. Oh, okay. I mean, I I'm not from I, you know I mean I mean most of what I know about cubic threefolds has to do with the whole like irrationality based on the intermediate Jacobian, which happens in like higher degree. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for a smooth, I mean, for a smooth cubic threefold, this is gonna say that it has to have the card rank one. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think if it's singular, then, then, you know, you still have this, but then you can't conclude the thing you'd like about the card group. Okay, so, so I now want to give kind of like a brief, maybe not a sign, but just kind of a brief kind of discourse about Hodge theory. So the kind of, you know, so, so the idea is that you have this Durham theory that differentials can represent cohomology. And the reason for that is just like, let me just, you know, like the, the simplest basic example, let's say, so differentials. Uh, represent is that if you imagine you have just the punctured plane, then the topology of this is, it's not simply connected, it is fundamental group Z because it's homotopy equivalent to the circle, right? So you have a loop around the origin, and the way you can kind of count how many loops around the origin you have is via the winding number. But this is something you could represent using the theory of differentials. So the idea being that you can say, okay, well, what I do is I say, well, I find some multi-valued function that 
tells me like how far I've gone around the loop. So, you know, you can think of it as just like the angle relative to the origin. And then I differentiate that so that I get actually a well-defined differential form. So the differential form d theta, where I just think of theta as the angle with between this and the and you know the horizontal, that's a well-defined differential form everywhere except zero, but it's the punctured plane. And then this tells you, um, you know, and, and so then you know if, if you integrate this around a path and then divide by two pi then, you know, if I call this path gamma, then the integral along gamma of d theta, like one over two pi times this, this is gonna equal three, just the winding number. Okay, so, and then the point is that, you know, Durand's cohomology theory tells us that this is pretty general, is that for any, uh, for any homology class, you can find, you know, or for any cohomology class, you can find a differential that represents that class. And then the point of Hodge theory is that, that these differentials, they have kind of a bigger structure when you kind of, when you think of them with respect to complex conjugation. So you have differentials that are more or less holomorphic. So, theory. So we break, or let's say we decompose differentials according to how holomorphic they are. Your z's is holomorphic functions, your z bars is anti holomorphic functions. So, you know, you have local things like dz1 wedge dz2 wedge up to dzk. And then you're going to wedge this with, you know, dz1, you know, 1 wedge dz2 bar up through wedge, you know, dzj. Um, and this has, you know, which is going to have type. A, J. But the point here is that, you know, this is still going to be, you know, some differential of, you know, of the appropriate, um, you know, this is still going to represent a cohomology class in degree K plus J. So, so this represents a cohomology class. In degree a plus j, and what we end up with is we end up with the h of uh, i plus uh, yeah, let's just say h of k plus j, or let's just or sorry, let's say h of uh, m of x with c coefficients decomposes as uh, you know, i m minus i you know, h i m minus i x c. So, so, so this perspective on a Hodge theory is very analytic. Um, so the only thing that we're going to need is a way of thinking about these groups in an algebraic way. And the result that we need is that if I have uh, h um, I, J of X, C, I can identify that with an algebraic object, which is namely H, I of X, and then I'm taking the order J differentials. Yeah, 
Maybe maybe I'm supposed to have HJI here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's probably right. Right, because the point is that this is the holomorphic part. So it had better be, you know, you know, so somehow somehow the anti-holomorphic part is taken care of by the HJ, by the J here, and then the holomorphic part is just taken care of by the I. So when J is zero, you just get the holomorphic differentials back. Okay, and then somehow the i homology. So, you know, Hodge theory gets you a lot of really nice results, but it's somehow like the algebraic side, it seems it's like some of it's like very mysterious because it's like there's a whole lot of analytic theory that you somehow managed to, to, to sneak in there. Okay, so we're not going to really need the whole machinery for what we're about to do, but the main thing that we're going to use this for today is to prove the Kajira vanishing theorem. And so what we're going to need for that is just the fact that you know, so the, the restriction, the isomorphism between uh, hi of xz and hi of, of dz, well, you know, if you change the coefficients, you still get an isomorphism. So you get hi of xc isomorphic to hi of dc. And then this tells us that hi of x o x is isomorphic to hi of d o d. Okay, and then the point here is that this map isn't just, like, it's not just coming from, you know, it's just not just an abstract map, but it's a concrete map coming from restriction. So the idea is that if I have some co-cycle on x, which is like, you know, I can view it as a co-cycle on D just by restriction, just by saying, okay, well, what does this co-cycle say about cycles that live only on D? That's what this restriction map is saying. The same when I'm doing it with whatever coefficients. And then the idea is to say, well, well, that's just the same as restricting the differential. Because what does it say, you know? So that's like literally thinking of the pullback of the differential from from the big X to the small d, because that's how you compute the integral uh, along a path that's only in d. Okay, and then, but then this is just, you know, and so here's where like the Hodge theory comes in. It's like, this is the same as the, this isomorphism is the restriction map of, is, is what happens in the long exact sequence from the restriction map of functions on X, functions on d. So what we're going to use is that for D ample, and let's see, so here. This is for i less than n minus one. Is that right? And I have O of minus d to O of uh, x to O of d zero. Well, this isomorphism here is just what appears in the Restriction exact sequence. Um, and then, well, for i less than n minus 1, I get that, you know, so I have hi of o minus d to hi of ox to hi of od. So then I have this. H i plus one of O minus D. All right, and then this is an isomorphism. And the previous one was an isomorphism. So this one has to be a zero. 
Okay, and then for i equals n minus 1, the math, well, it's no longer, in, it's no longer going to be an isomorphism, but it is injective. So the next map over is injective. This one was surjective. So that means this one has to be 0 as well. So what this is telling us is that for i between 0 and n minus 1, that we have h i of o of x and minus d is equal to 0. Okay. And now we can apply ser duality. Well, ser duality says that if I have any divisor, then if I take hi of x uh, o x of well, let's just say minus d because that's what we're using over here. But you know the minus isn't important. Then this is isomorphic to the dual of this, which is plus d, tensored with the canonical divisor. So this is going to be h n minus i x o x of k x plus d. Well, if this guy is 0, then that guy is 0. So this tells us that for uh, j equals n minus i, or n j greater than 0, I have the hj of x, o x, ax plus d is equal to 0. And so what were the hypotheses we put in here? Well, we needed the hypotheses of the left shuts hyperplane theorem, which were that x is a projective smooth variety, and then that d is ample. And this is the Kadyra vanishing theorem. Okay. So this was our goal for the last two lectures, was, was to get to here. Um, so, yeah, I guess depending on what I feel like presenting, I may next time talk about, the like, how do you stretch this into the next theorem, which is the, uh, which is the Kawada Buick vanishing theorem. And I'm kind of, of like two minds about this, because on one hand, it's like the Kawada Buick vanishing theorem is like a much more powerful version of this theorem. Like, in practice, you know, it has this weird clunky statement, but you use it a lot and it just like, you know, it pays off so much. It's like, you know, um, you, you know, it, it, it like, you know, you can, you, you just get like so much more flexibility using that theorem than you do with this one. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the, the proof, the way you go from this statement to that one is kind of technical and it's not super enlightening. So, it's just kind of like, well, it's a bunch of like, you know, technical bookkeeping with, you know, uh, you know, handling, you know, cyclic covers and, uh, you know, uh, simple normal crossing divisors. So it's like, you know, the feeling is that like the, the insightful mathematical content is somehow like all here. Because, you know, you know, we, we've used a lot of like big and sort of foundational results in complex slash algebraic geometry to get to this point. Um, so, yeah. And then, you know, the, the next part is just kind of like, you know, you know, honing this amazing result into the tool you actually use in practice. Okay, so I don't, you know, I don't know if I'll actually present that next time, but, you know, we'll see. Um, I mean, do you guys want to see that or do you want to see something else? Well, I'll look, over, I'll look over some of the proofs and, and see how I feel about presenting it. Um, so, I, you know, I think it is something that's like, maybe it is worth seeing once just to, to kind of get an idea of, you know, how, 
how you can go from this statement here to one where the, the hypotheses are a little bit broadened and you know, you're in the context of having you know, an F and bigot divisor and you have like a boundary and that kind of thing. Okay, so the other thing is that um, in historical context, so when Canary approved this, it was for, uh, you know, it was for a positive line bundle on a complex, on a, on a uh, compact, complex analytic variety. So there's like a, there's a different version of this where you have D is a positive variety, so it's, it's a positive line bundle, so it's like a, a holomorphic line bundle that emits a positive, uh, you know, an everywhere positive, like a, a nice Hermitian metric that's like everywhere, that has, where the curvature form has all positive eigenvalues, and, uh, you know, and then you can prove this vanishing theorem. And then Kadair then used that to prove the Kadair embedding theorem, which says that if you have a variety, or like a complex manifold with such a positive line bundle on it, then you can use that line bundle to embed yourself into a projective space. And so therefore, you actually get an algebraic variety. So historically, this theorem was hugely important in kind of establishing how broadly you can use algebraic geometry to study complex manifolds. So you know, if you think about just like an arbitrary complex manifold, there's no you know, and like even assume it's like compact, then it seems like there's no real reason that like thinking about polynomials could really do anything for you. But once you have a positive line bundle, then you get an embedding in the projective space, and then suddenly you can say, well, then I can just define my variety by equations on that projective space, and then the geometry of projective space just says, well, those are only polynomial equations. Like you're not allowed to get anything else and still and avoid essential singularities uh, which, you know, which, you know, this forbids. So, you know, so that's kind of the historical context here. Um, I guess one other comment is that, uh, you know, these kind of vanishing theorems, you really need character, like, you, need, you really need characteristic zero to prove them. Um, you know, so you don't necessarily need, like, Hodge theory, but you're gonna, you need some sort of, mach like, analytic machinery to prove this, because this won't hold in characteristic P. And so this is one of the big obstacles to getting minimal model theory type results in positive characteristic. Although, let's see, so I think about like 10 years ago, there was a lot of positive progress on the MMP for three folds in positive characteristic. I think they can get it for, I think it was for P bigger than like seven or something. Um, but you know, it, it was again, kind of one of these things where it required some specialized knowledge about what happens in dimension three, and they had to deal with the section lifting using uh, using entirely kind of different approach than this one. Okay, so that'll be it for today.